Hello, everybody, and welcome to Getting APIs to Work. Today, we'll have another episode of What Would the Web Do? We'll talk about avoiding API lock-in, designing and building for change. So one of the topics we are discussing a lot is that APIs are all about landscape, loose coupling, loose collaboration in large organizations, across organizations. So you want to make sure that whatever you build is built for change. And I think that is one of the important things that you can look at. And we'll discuss two things. One will be the rule of two, which I think you kind of also were part of in creating that. And then we'll discuss Tim Berners-Lee principle of least power. First, let's talk a little bit how to design for a change. And there, I think this, this rule of two that, that you also use a lot when you describe things is really interesting. Tell us a little bit about what it is and why it's an important thing to keep in mind. Yeah, this 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 idea of the rule of two came out of discussions with Arakli Natarashvili. Arakli, you know, used to be a part of the API Academy that you and I were a part of at one time. And we were talking about how you can sort of build in uh, build in the ability to change or to kind of try to ensure this loose coupling idea that you don't get too tightly integrated. And um, I, we were just kind of discussing this, and I, he claims I said this first, but I, I don't really remember it quite. Is that is the idea? If you assume that you have at least one alternative for everything in production, so uh, I, I'm storing data in you know here, but I also have a, a, a data storage medium here, or I'm using Node, but I also support Rust um, or something like that. If you always have at least one alternative ready to go into production you'll build things in a more loosely tied way, a loosely coupled way. You won't build everything as a sort of a monolithic. You won't get sucked into that doing everything as one. So, so that's kind of the, the, the rule of two. And, and basically, um, Rackley has a nice blog post on this, on this topic. Uh, he calls uh, a rule of twos. And we're not quite sure why there's twos, but it's that rule of twos. For any critical component, make sure you use at least two alternatives kind of build in that notion. Uh, and I think that's going to be very, very powerful because it keeps you from getting too, too closely tied or too you know, closely wedded to just one way of solving a problem. Have you, have you seen anything like this or do you have anything like this in your experience as well? Yeah, sure. I, I think one of the things that you see nowadays a lot is like the, the multi-cloud strategies or hybrid, right? That in some yeah. regard, you could say that is one instance of the rule of two, right? Where you say that I don't want to be coupled for life to whatever cloud service I'm using right now. It's fine for me. It works. But also, if at some point it's not fine for me anymore or I want to move away from it for whatever reason, how easy will it be for me to do? And I think it's exactly like you said. If, if you exercise this thought process of how hard is it for me to move from one thing to another thing, then the step of extending that to three, four, or five is actually relatively simple because you have you've thought about how hard it is to move away to move away from one thing. I think that's the important part there, right? How hard is the way to move away from one thing? And once you've done that, I think you're you're much better um, prepared for changing the way you do things. Yeah, I think the way the way Arakli and I were talking about this was, um, you know, you don't want to assume that your database is local, right? I have it on the same machine as my web pages or something. You want to assume that it might be local, but it also might be a remote source, like an S3 bucket in the cloud, right? So if you assume that it might be, you know, there might be some alternative, it changes the way I interface with the database. Now I realize, well, you know, at some point the database might be far away. So let me plan now, let me build in the idea that um, we have a loose coupling to the data storage model. Don't assume that it's always going to be SQL uh, queries. It might be GraphQL or it might be uh, some other kind of, of query system, query language. So don't build the SQL query language into your API because if you move to another kind of uh, data storage model, suddenly that, that may not make sense. So I think that's, that's that same idea. And then once, like you said, once you make that 
that build that change in to at least one alternative, then you realize, well, you know, it could be a document database or an object database or just a file system. Suddenly you realize you have lots of other options available to you at a relatively low cost. You don't have to break a lot of things in order to support an alternative. And I think that's pretty powerful. And the way you phrase it right now, I like that a lot. It's, it also tells you, okay, in, in order to do that, because we're, this episode is called Avoiding API Lock-in, right? It, right. If you design APIs outside in, I think that gives you a much better starting point, right? Because you think about what is it that I want to do and how can I design an API for doing it without making a decision already how that API is implemented, right? And, and then if you do that well, it, it's relatively easy for you to say, okay, I can now implement that API in a variety of ways, in a variety of places, but the API actually remains stable because like you said, I may have avoided certain specific design things that I might put in there if I'm more of a inside out kind of API designer. Yeah, or, or the idea that um, implementation details leak into the interface, right? Like I, I use the example of using SQL query uh, language, right? So suddenly SQL query language is part of the interface where you're kind of stuck there, right? A, a way, one of the ways that I constantly exercise this rule of twos or alternatives is I'm really big on separating uh, response representation format from the actual uh, data service of the API. So Give me, give me the response for sales figures in HTML or in uh, HAL or in simple JSON or in collection.json or, or in PNG, you know, like the representation format. My little framework that I use for all of my, uh, my works for my books and everything, I use a templating language for the format. So if you ask for it in uh, collection JSON, you get that that format and what's brilliant is i just went through this because i'm working on some other uh, demos um i wanted to introduce a new format <clears throat> to my service well all i had to do is write the one representation piece uh and add it to the list i didn't have to rewrite anything else about my api so this idea of adopting that rule of tools or alternates can really pay off later on in the process when you want to make a change so that's a different location where you ran into this example, right? Not so much a different implementation, but now how how closely am I married to serving this exact one format and how hard will it be for me to change that? So I think the challenge here a little bit then is that there probably are a whole bunch of places where you can apply this rule, but... Yeah. Yeah. That's probably over time, that's something that you realize that... it's probably Maybe that's something that you learn by painful exercises where at some point you had to go through a lot of effort to actually move from one thing to a different thing. And then you keep that in your mind, like you probably did with your framework and said, I'm not going to make this mistake again. <laughs> and I think, I think there's an, there's another sort of knock on effect, which is when, when you lower the cost or you lower the risk of making a change like that or making an addition like that, you also uh, lower the resistance to making the change. Uh, the way I, to use this format uh, example again, often I would get into conversations with people about, we're gonna have to decide on which is the ultimate format that we're gonna use for all of our APIs across the entire company. Everybody uses the same format. Well, then you get into these long drawn out debates about which format is best. But if it turns out that using an alternate format is a safe, cheap, cheap and easy experience, it's one of the alternatives along the way, People don't argue so much. They say, ah, we'll start with plain JSON. If we need something else, we'll just add it later, right? All of a sudden, it becomes less of, a, less of an emotional as well as technical challenge in order to make a decision. Yeah, I think this, the principle really helps you to understand that for, for all problems that you're facing, there never is the best solution, right? There That's is. right. A couple right. of good solutions, and it should be easy for you to switch from one good solution to another good solution, and then you're kind of well set to uh, avoid lock-in, right, to, to one yep. thing. And yep. I think this is actually a very nice segue to our second topic, which is this question of if you believe that there is a best solution, then 
this gives you a very, very different kind of design approach, I would say, an approach of how much you're investing into a specific technology or a solution, how much you see the risk of moving away from it, right? That So that gets, gets us then to this principle of least power, which I think is connected to the rule of two, but it's a little different. Yeah, um, so I first learned about the principle of least power when I was reading into the history of the web, of uh, the World Wide Web. So Tim Berners-Lee actually references it in his late 1990s writings about the, the way he wanted to design the web. And he had this idea that the more powerful languages you use or the more powerful technology you use uh, actually limits its reuse. In other words, it becomes so tuned and so carefully honed to solve one particular problem that it's hard to get it to solve lots of other problems. And of course, if you think about what Tim Berners-Lee was trying to do, he was trying to create a, a, a format and a communication pattern that pe anybody could use, anybody he, you know, people he'd never met solving problems he didn't know anything about. He specifically said he made sure his HTML approach wasn't a programming language because he wanted to lower the bar for the power needed in order to pull it off. And he wanted to make it easy for anybody to kind of get involved with. So I think this, this uh, principle of least power, uh, what later gets uh, released as, as a, as a uh, technical uh, architectural guidance document, a tag document by the WC3, is this notion of keeping it, it's sort of a version of keeping it simple, right? Keeping it simple and stable, right? Uh, let's let's use the least power to solve a problem. Yeah, and it's a specific way of interpreting the word power. I think it's you know it's like the power of the technology, which I think in if we look at the web, it at least back when it started, it was really it, it was a simple thing, right? And I I, I still oh, yeah. remember when I when when I was teaching web technologies that was in the mid late nineties to you know, people from industry who had never heard of the web before and wanted to learn about it. I got a lot of feedback saying like, this is primitive. The the, the mm -hmm. forms look weird. You can't do much thing. There's no client side validation, like all this stuff. And uh, it was like, yep, that's what it is. And But I, I, I think what was interesting was that A, as we all know, the web still kind of succeeded, I'd say. Yeah. <laughs> and, oh, yeah. and the other thing is also that, you know, the power of, yes, the web as a technology was definitely relatively simple, good enough for forms and stuff. Mm -hmm. But the power of the web being not limited to one platform and of the ability, you know, to have web interfaces on, on Unix machines, on Windows, on, on Macs, right? So this power, that actually was pretty good, right? Because I think that... I mean, and I don't really know, you know, how this power fits into the, the least power equation. But that part is like, it's kind of a little bit of a, I would say, a trade-off, right? The, the more you tune that thing, the harder it is, for example, yeah. to support it. You know, to, you can you can think about think about it this way. I agree with you 100%, by the way. There's a sort of a, almost two versions of this, this use of the word power in English. So... Um, you know, Tim Berners-Lee famously built his first version of the World Wide Web on one of the new Apple Next Cubes, right? This was yeah. like the, 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 the highest technology at the time. This is like really unique. And Tim Berners-Lee could have built the web to only run on Next Cube, right? He could have used certain codes and everybody could have, you know, he could have made everybody use the same source code uh, as, as he did. And they would all have to use this, have the same powerful next code, next cube machine in order to run the web. But he chose not to do that, right? He chose, like you said, to just pass simple forms, simple markup pages, uh, so that you didn't have to have a next cube to be part of his system. You could use whatever machine you had on hand. This was at a time when you know windowing software, Motif and X Windows, and all these things were becoming really powerful, and yet. Tim Berners-Lee doesn't use any of that windowing technologies using simple sort of almost line by line green screen kind of style. He's reducing the power required to participate, which I think is was really a brilliant, brilliant move. And I think that's part of that, that trade off that you were talking about. And maybe this other power that I was mentioning, maybe a better word for it would be to say potential. You know, it's like 
like all the like what I can do because I have made it relatively easy to implement. Now it won't be that hard to implement on different machines for different um, graphical yeah. user environments, right? So it's it's much harder to have a super complex interface, right, being re-implemented somewhere than just you know a simple thingy that has a couple of text boxes and and a submit button. That's yeah. <laughs> Actually, you make a really good point, and that is, you. Uh, I, th I think Tim Merners Lee probably. I'm kind of putting myself in his head, but he probably was thinking about how would it be re-implemented by somebody else, right? Uh, I so, think that was part of the design goals, right? Because the idea yeah. was that like, all physicists should be able to do that. So <laughs> yeah, not not all physicists have have next machines, right? That's for yes. sure. <laughs> yeah, you know, I, I remember a similar conversation that Roy Fielding had because he was involved in some of the earliest coding of of World Wide Web and HTTP. They originally had, he said, a library which was called it was in Perl, I think it was a www object or the HTTP object or something like that object library. And he said, in uh, it was causing problems in the beginning because everyone thought in order to run the World Wide Web on their machine, they needed to use this library module, oh, yeah. which was a you know a Perl library module. For for uh, Roy Fielding, then that's when he started to develop his notion of this representational transfer model. He wanted to create a more abstract model that other people could implement in any way they wished, and they they thought about that through the process of of growing HTTP. Now that's a much more abstracty version of it. But I think it sort of follows the same theme that that Tim Berners Lee originally had, and that is that the more powerful the language and the more involved the implementation is, the less reuse or re-implementation that you have. So I think I think that's all kind of tied into that same thread. Yes, I think that's definitely the case, and and I think that that's a good way to kind of wrap up our discussion around you know avoiding API lock-in because I think. At some level, you could say for APIs, the your goals, your eventual goals, are very similar to the goals of the web. You want to make it easy for consumers to consume whatever you're providing, right? On the web, it's a user interface. On for APIs, it's an API. But but you want to make it easy for somebody to use that technology without having to go through a highly complex process of Im implementing something that is just really hard to implement. Yep. And I think that's that's why we saw such a big boost of of the REST APIs, right? Because it was so yeah. simple to use REST because there yep. were HTTP libraries all around, right? And then on top of that, there was not that much to be done. So Yep. Yep. I agree 100%. I think I think one of the things that that I come away with from this discussion is really sinking it's really sinking in that value of if you want to prevent lock-in lower the barrier of entry use the least power necessary to solve that problem and assume that there are going to be alternatives uh, at some point out there if not now later somebody's going to implement it differently somebody's going to come up with a better idea for the way this yep. particular part of the system works so those two things uh, low barrier of entry and the ability to change it later those are two really powerful ways to prevent lock-in. And make it easy for those alternatives to appear, right? I think that yeah. is always like one of the things that sometimes gets lost a little bit when you know people have these ideas of, yeah, everybody can use that. All they have to do is like use all of this. Because yeah, all of this. nothing works without this. Right. right. So yeah. Like, yeah, yep. that's kind of a big dependency right there. So yeah, that's right. Yeah. That's cool. That's good. I love that. Okay, so I think that was a really nice kind of combination of two interesting topics. Um, and I think that both, even though they are showing up on the web, both apply very well to the API space. So keep it yep. simple. I think that's a good takeaway. Yep. And always think about alternatives. I think that's also a very good takeaway. It's like we're going to close the loop on this one, yeah. and just like this episode, and I'll see you sometime soon. Okay. As usual, thanks a lot for joining. I hope everybody enjoyed this session and see you soon on this channel. Bye, everybody. Bye-bye.